sure. Well, Ken's come. Ken's over here. So I just wanted to welcome uh, all of you to our lovely uh, McDowell House. The, oh, you can sneak oh, yeah, down. <laughs> um, uh, so I just want to welcome you all. Thank you, uh, those of you that came. Uh, this this presentation, uh, we are at the Eastside Heritage Center. We are Bellevue, Kirkland, and well, we're primarily Bellevue's historical society, but we support heritage uh, opportunities and activities in Kirkland, Redmond, and the greater east side. Do um, you know all these people? I now, yes, I've met everyone in this room. These know, two are, are new to me this evening. No, really. And I guess the three of you are new. Let's have them introduce themselves then, if they're new to the group. We certainly could, if folks want to introduce themselves. Should we all hold hands? <laughs> Make a little circle. We are a small group. I think there's some sure. intimacy here. So I'll start. I'm Josh Davis. I'm the executive director of the Eastside Heritage Center. And I'm going to send it right here to my friend. Gene Sherrard. <laughs> there, there I am. There's Gene. And then behind you, uh, Okay. <laughs> well, uh, we're going to, Paul has been doing this column since uh, January of 1982. And so it's, we're just completing his 37th year of the column, and that adds up to about 1,800 different columns. Wow. wow. Which is huh. significant. And I've worked with him on maybe 600, so only a third of them. So we'll be here until 3.30 in the morning. Yes, we're going to go through all 1,800 columns, <laughs> and this is a problem why. <laughs> Show some respect. Mm -hmm. I think it's not a problem. I'd like to see it. Oh, well, it would take us some time. <clears throat> Interestingly, we, we, uh, we, we discovered that neither the Times nor the Seattle Public Library, which has the archive for the Times, contains more than a few hundred of those columns over the past 37 years. If you did a search for Dorpat in the Times Archive, mm -hmm. you, you get about 400 hits, and only half of them are even columns. So if like you do a search day by day. Well, you can't find, no, it's, it's complete. I mean, you can't find you except 400 times in the Times, and I know that you've done 1,800 columns. So to solve that problem, we, uh, Clay and I, and a couple of other, uh, Paul's other friends, have pillaged his basement and actually taken the columns out of a file cabinet and they are slowly being converted all into searchable PDFs. I go to bed. Yay. Wow. I go so, to bed at uh, 6 in the morning and so, get up at 1. So they came during that time. Yes. Like little uh, basement elves? They were. <laughs> and Paul was a shoemaker and they were the elves. So we're slowly adding these up. Uh, 50 to 100 at a time, and we're finding a way to put them on our blog, which is easy to remember because it's PaulDorpat.com. Oh, okay. right. <laughs> so we start this program. We, you're our seventh program, and we start this show with a little um, homage to Dorpat. Oh, I think can we skip that? And just go to the no, we're going to do it quickly. <laughs> if you won't talk your way through it. If nobody asks questions, we can get to it quickly, but this is about doorpath. Could we ask them if anybody brought any donuts with them? You've got yes. two cookies. You've had two cookies. That's your you I'm cutting you off right now. There are, are the no other, donuts. Where are the cookies? Where are the cookies? You already have two. I want another one. You can't have one. And I'll show you why Paul is behaving this way. Because he was the baby of the... Here we go. Your mom and dad were teachers. Can you figure that one out? Both my mom and dad were teachers. So, yes. So as we go through Paul's life, we of course start with this classic slide, and, and Paul named it many years ago, of Paul in North Dakota in the war years. World War II, Gene. Well, I know. And what do you call this slide? I'm giving you an opening here. Oh, this is called Saving the World for Democracy. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm good with that. Where at North Dakota? Grand Forks, uh, Reeves Drive. Nice. Overlooking the... I know exactly where it is. Oh, yeah, you do? Have you spent time there? I spent two weeks finishing up my master's degree at the university. Wonderful. Wow. I know exactly the neighborhood. Sure, we were overlooking that river. Yep. And the floods you know, came right up to the... Well, you just said you wanted to skip this right now, Paul. <laughs> I mean, I'm Paul, fire. you just said, oh, let's skip right through this, and now we're going to spend five minutes we're on Grand Forks. <laughs> we're flexible. 
you guys can talk I after the show as long as you want. You can spend, you see, the more we do this, you and I, the less he talks. So that, there you have a point, don't you? What's this? What's this? Oh, I thought you didn't want me to talk. Okay, so one of these, Paul demanding his donuts. There he is, the first time he ever demanded donuts. He's the baby of the family. Uh, he's the kid, and he's the only remaining door pad. Let's go to them all today. I took this picture maybe 10, 12, 14 years ago. Did you take that? Did I did take this. Yep. That's a nice Where was photo. it? Out at the... It was out at your, one of your nephews or nieces' oh, yeah. houses in Tacoma. Yeah. In Richmond, maybe. No, no. no it, was, it was south of Seattle. We did, you, did you all migrate to the coast eventually? Well, my dad was a preacher yeah. in Lutheran Church, and he got, as they call it, a call. Mm. To there he is. So the family nice. wound up. This is uh, Reverend Darpat, and that is yeah. Reverend experiencing the call <coughs> right there. You can see it. So you can see excited. it. He's excited about it, and that's his mom, Cherry. Yeah, door pat. And there's Paul on the left. And I think you look a lot like your dad. You could probably sub for your I dad right now. I didn't know that. Yeah. I see it. In the late 60s, Paul uh, founded and edited a, a counterculture magazine that for we kids in the Northwest was uh, a way to, to upset our parents. We'd take posters and put it on the wall. And as, when I was 10 years old, I had... Uh, Couple different posters of, of uh, designed by a friend of Paul's, Walt Crowley, and who started history. Uh, nice. And uh, so Paul was the editor of the Helix, and that that was around for three years. Yeah. Like that. And out of that, he did a uh, uh, he was a rock promoter, and he created a yeah. sort of remarkable uh, few several festivals: the Sky River Rock Festival and the Lighter Than Air Fair. In which wasn't the light of the air fair? Wasn't that the piano drum? No, the light of the air fair was uh, the idea of actually going into the air with a balloon, and one of the guys got a balloon, and a few people went in the air. I was too heavy for it. So no, the piano drop prelude at this, and when the piano drop occurred at Duval, it was so popular, like about three thousand people showed up, that we figured let's do a festival. We knew about the Monterey Festival, but that was inside at the county, uh, the county, whatever you call those places, or county house. The stadium or stadium, yeah, like that. So we we did the uh, first Sky River in a farm up, uh, up uh, on the Sky Comish River. This is about a year before Woodstock. And wow. famously, yeah. it was a year wow. before Woodstock. Richard Pryor. Some amazing right. water. The yacht was uh, set up a stage for Richard Pryor. Santana. Santana. And there, I think, didn't you get uh, for both the piano drop and for both festivals? Didn't you have Country Joe and the fish come oh, yeah. out? But these people don't know Country Joe. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 We, 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 were, we were raised on that music. Yeah. Yeah. We know all these guys. Yeah. So here's Paul with Tom Robbins at the actual festival, wearing his Buddhist saffron robe. Nice. Huh. And then that was my girlfriend. You want to see my girlfriend? What? Don't they have lower right angle? Oh, yeah. oh, Is she Scandinavian? I think she's got to be. She's got a facial hair problem. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the the other name for this festival was Mud River, not just Sky River, but Mud River. And that was for a reason. It rained a lot that mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. Labor Day weekend. That one sometimes. A very famous photo. And we said that if anyone can identify themselves as having been in that photo, they'll get a free book. Uh, oh, I just said it. <laughs> we just do that the rest of the way. So by the late 70s, early 80s, Paul was actually working as a historian. He published this a few months before he started his column, 294 Glimpses of Historic Seattle, and he sold it for the grand total of 294 cents. And he says he sold... 80,000 no, copies. 40,000. 40,000, okay. I have a copy of that. You do? No, there it's you very cool. Did you, get, did you get it for 294? Well, I don't remember. It's been a long time ago, but I, I have that one. No, you it should have brought it tonight. Fall was fine. It is good. Sorry, I didn't. So the Times 
he started his column at the Times uh, within uh, a few months of that. Uh, this is um, uh, his uh, his mentor, Murray Morgan. Right, uh, right. Oh, Murray Morgan. Raise your hands. I've heard the name. I don't know. That's pretty good. You should read. You, you yeah. should read his books. Yeah, the the, the book that I have, have is is um, Road, Puget Sound. Puget Sound. Yeah, what a great book. That That's is. a great one. Yeah, yeah, it's about Tacoma. You know, and we did a book uh, about 10 years ago called Washington Then and Now, where we wandered around the state and did what we did for this book. Right. Mm -hmm. We, um, I was in Tacoma shooting, and I remember standing on the 11th Street Bridge at rush hour, mm -hmm. and the bridge was empty. But what made it significant was it was the bridge where Murray Morgan spent quite a I mean, several years of his life as the as the bridge tender. Now, wasn't it? Wasn't he up there for a while? No, not that Ooh. long. I don't know how long, but it wasn't several years. <laughs> he was too busy. And the uh, the uh, it's a great really, way to write books because no one there was no travel. Well, he wrote Skid Road for the most part. Yeah. That I, was what you were going to say, right? Yeah. yeah. Did they rename the really fancy pants room in the Tacoma yes, Public Library they did. downtown? Uh, yeah, the beautiful they library did. after the dome. It's a room. beautiful. They room. did. We were actually there for the inauguration. Yes, yeah. we were. We drove down with Gene did and I hitched a ride. And I think Jenny went to that one too. Now let's see. There's Paul in full cry with Lucy Campbell Coe, who lived through and watched as a as a toddler the Seattle Fire. Mm -hmm. Wow. So this is uh, I did want to talk more about Murray, but I guess we can't. Well, we can talk more about Murray. They're they're happy to be here till three. I don't think so. <laughs> How are your pets? My cat is fine. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Heidi, no. Heidi, no, no, Heidi is your name. What's yes. your cat's name? Luna. Luna, that's a Luna, good name Luna for a cat. Yeah. Now that picture, that that's the one that was at the, when you told me you weren't there, this is the one that was at uh, Lohai. Yes. That's right. We took over a room at Lohai. Is that you're talking about? Well, no, but it was still there when I went to hear when I, when I was there with, uh, with uh, yeah, you made me forget. Um, Ken Burns. Ken Burns, thank you. Is that, well, is that Sean? Ken Burns was never at Ohio. No, that's here. from, uh, no, just No, it might not have been, but this was still there. And was is that there. Paul or is that Paul's stunt double? So well, Ken, uh, Ken Burns did not kind of look like, so. <laughs> well, we're going we're gonna to play with the look like in a second here. Okay. This is a show from 2011, <coughs> and basically Mohai gave us free reign. They gave us a big room and said, do what you will, we're moving downtown. Uh, and we put a l dozens of photos around the walls. Mm -hmm. And our friend uh, from Paris, a Parisian photographer, did uh, uh, the foyer was all Paris. Yes, a picture. Mm -hmm. I do. Let's take a look. Oh, there she is. Nice. Mm -hmm. So there are the three of us in 2011 for that show. And a few years before that, she lived in Seattle when she was 17, visited a friend of Paul's. And a few years, uh, in about 2005, Paul reconnected with Berenger. And we went over to see her. And uh, on our first trip to visit her, and we've been back and forth several times now, our first trip to visit Berenger, or Bibi as she's known, we, we had a, a rather extraordinary event that I'm just going to play you the video. Yeah, so many coming on the other way. What are you doing there? Very much like me, doesn't he? He does. Put the glasses, put the glasses. Take this with you. Okay. They don't. That's really amazing. Isn't that a girl? Now wait. So Berenger says, no, go back. i got to get a picture. She pulls out her big camera. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> She's got her zoom lens on, and then I walked around and got another couple shots here. That is just amazing. Is <laughs> he <laughs> playing Mojang or something? What's he doing? <laughs> You can't hold the camera. 
I was just laughing so hard I, I could barely hold it straight. Look at this look that he gives now. Yeah, there he's like. That's excellent. Here's the shot she took of the two of them. Oh, that's and we had no idea who this guy was, and, and Berger went back about five years later and tracked him down. And he is a Romanian Orthodox priest in Paris, and there he is in about 2013. That's really funny. In his wow. church. And Phoebe also took that shot. She did. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Phoebe just did a, a video on, uh, on this book, uh, or sort of introducing this book. It's got one big problem. What is it? Oh, uh, she interviews me about a picture that I completely misrepresented. Uh oh. I said it was buses and it was trolleys. Uh -oh. I know it was trolleys, but I said buses. Oh, yeah. And I'm terribly ashamed. You pill. <laughs> All we, right. Can we edit it, please? Well, you can ask Phoebe to edit it. Oh, I'll do, I'll do or we can just take the soundtrack and I'll just say, you can make I'll just put your voice in. We can say, whenever you say buses, I'll just put in trolleys. Let's do that. <laughs> Trolley. I like that best. Be good then. All right, let's start with Paul's very first column. Oh, oh. Okay, guys, this is the start of the show. All right. So do you want to really maybe sit up straight so you don't get cramps? And it's a while before Perfect. it's over, you know. And where are the cookies now? They're still in the kitchen, Paul. In the kitchen, are they? Yeah. I think I'll go there. Okay. I've seen this before. <laughs> Here we go. Not I'm not getting you up. I'll get up. Got to convince the knees to do that. There you go. All oh, right. Yeah. Uh, are you really going on a cookie run? I am. So I'm going to go get you the cookies. Go ahead well. with the show. I'll go get you the cookies. You can well, 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 the cookie. No. I'll go get you. I haven't had dinner. Well, then you can have it. <laughs> I know. I probably it's should. It's dessert. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 I'll get you cookies. I think I'll give you the ones you want. You're so bothered with it. You have more of the cookies. There's so much wonderful detail in that. We could just sit and wait, Paul. No one's in a hurry here. Well, he's going to get the cookies. So are you going to tell the are you going to start and tell the meeting? Shall we shall we go ahead and talk about the actual Yeah, let's go. I love this. Take a month. Okay. Are these the cookies for the month? Just for tonight. Did you eat dinner? Just for tonight, yeah. Okay. I love this time. I did. I did. I should can't eat those things. They're all yours, man. Hey, whenever you guys are ready, just let me know. I'm, I'm just, I'm just sitting here. Just so, audience, have your cookies. We have our cookies. We don't care about you, really. Do you? Okay, well, I'll just, I'll just wait. I'm gonna be passing the rest of here. You don't. I wouldn't. I would. I'll wait out. I can wait. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So this is March 12, 1919. And it's the return home after the First World War of the 63rd Coastal Artillery. And it was a huge homecoming celebration. They filled the streets. And we're looking right now at the, at the corner of, at, at Westlake, 4th and Pine. Oh. Wow. So, so is it typical in World War I to um, create battalions and things out of people that were from the same area? Because they stopped doing that after a while in case the battalion got wiped out, right? They from like the Sullivan Brothers. For example, I, I think that uh, I can't answer that question, but I, I'm assuming that the welcome home was was substantial enough that they yeah. were happy to have the homeboys home. Wow. For the uh, uh, the medics that took care of the injuries to Seattle fighters that went to the First World War, and probably this group, they were all from Spokane, Seattle. Mm -hmm. They, they raised money to build hospitals, you know, and they trained together. So yeah, there was a kind of organizing of fighting the war on the U.S. part, uh, locally. So my goal of doing repeats is to find, especially for this book, is to find something significant enough to, in some way, mirror or match or reference a crowd or, a, or an event. Right. And what I found was took place on January 21st, 1917, and it's actually the largest march in Seattle's history. And it was the Women's March uh, just after the inauguration. 
who they are terrified. How many of you went to the Women's March? Raise your hands. One, two. I missed it the first year I went, uh, which would have been this uh, year I missed. Yeah. yeah, I missed it the first year. Yeah. And this is Paul's repeat from fall of 82. And this was the very first combination of photos that appeared in the column in, in January of 82. So what that building is now, that's where the Aunt Carrie is stored? Okay. Yep. And that was a, a Bartels drugstore for many years. Oh. Which building? The corner slot there, the, the what is now the, the Westlake building there, yeah. which is Arcteryx. It, it had, uh, we actually did a column about this about three years ago with a motorcycle delivery guy. And if you go into any Bartels, you can see their, one of their delivery people on the just on the other side of that building, ready to deliver drugs for Bartels. <laughs> I knew these were coming over here. I didn't <laughs> tell. <laughs> You're going to have a whole bunch of them. Oh, you That's a them? really cool definition. <laughs> so this is our, this is the first, and, and what we did in the book was to create a series of chronological order. Right. Uh, we start with the very first column, and we just worked our way through. Uh, and uh, my my goal was to reshoot uh, modern photos to replace the the photos that uh, are some of them you know, nearly forty years old. So we jump forward to Seattle's deepest snow. This was in, on January fourth, eighteen eighty. And for about eight days, over eight days, about 64 inches of snow fell. And this is looking up first in Cherry. And I went back to a rather meager repeat, but at least I got some flakes. <laughs> and this is also looking up Cherry. Wow, look at that. seems so much less steep than it is. <laughs> you know, often. There were a lot of regrades that went on. Too high and too steep so by David Williams. Yeah, that great, book. A great That's book great. to talk about the reason why many of these originally steep hills were were made less steep. That's why they called First Hill. Um, what was the name for it? The lawyers gave to it before they regraded. Uh, profanity Hill. Profanity Hill. Right. So here we are looking on the waterfront, and this is taken by the, Nor the soon-to-be Norwegian photographer Anders Vilsa. He came from Norway, lived in Seattle for a while, and took some remarkable pictures, and then went back to Norway and became their national treasure. This is a photo he took on the waterfront in the late 1890s, at the foot of Pike Street. And you can see the smokestacks, and to me, uh, this was a sign, all the dirt in these, in, in, at this time, in the part of the industrial age, the dirt and the smoke uh, for our industrialists meant muck and money. Muck meant money. You look at that smoke and you think, I'm collecting silver in my in my bank account right now. I've seen some of his prints, or I guess high-res scans that Ron Edge has. Yeah. The detail in them is just insane. And that's Ron Edge. He's also the man, a master of detail. Ron's the man. Yeah. That's a Northern Pacific box car. Anyway. So here we are looking down the same street from, with a few of my students in the photo from, uh, who actually go to uh, the little school in Bellevue up on top of above Eastgate. And I take them on little historical tours of the market and the waterfront. Are you anticipating repeating that photo in about a year? You know, we have to, this is subject to discussion, because if we, if we come out with another edition, we have to consider doing something to, uh, in about the half dozen photos in which the viaduct figure right. figures. And it depends on how many books you buy this year. Yeah. <laughs> Good answer. Good so, answer. So this is another Andersville's photo taken uh, of the waterfront gold rush, and in a, in a, in a few months, in the winter of... Uh, and spring of 1898, 107 ships sailed for the Klondike in 99 days. And you can see that they were selling aluminum houses, and they only weighed 150 pounds. So a strong guy 
could hike up into the into the Yukon and into the Klondike and and uh, and erect his little aluminum hut to work with. That's a beefy pack over the Yeah, they might be, but yeah. Paul, was it you that told me that the only people who made any money in the gold rush were the Outfitters in Seattle? <laughs> no, I didn't tell you that. Yeah, I've heard that from somebody. I thought no, it might have been you. That's one of the cliches. One of the cliches. It certainly yeah. isn't true, though. It just means that a lot more people went there than got money because, you know, you had to luck out besides being strong and fortified with the proper tools. And, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but so, so this is the, the same place. general location. Wow. We're looking up from, uh, from the same spot as pretty much where Vilsa stood. Mm -hmm. uh, now he left Seattle and went back to Norway, as I said, and they've actually, they came out with a, with a whole series of Vilsa stamps mm -hmm. in Norway, and his photographs are just, they're, uh, you might recognize some of them because they really are emblematic of, of, of this particular time. For the next 30 years, he was- You mean this place? Of this place in time. Wow. Not, I'm talking about his portraits of Norwegians, yeah. which are stunning. And they're they're uh, magnificent. And, and they're already kind of a stunning, uh, stunning to look at anyway. Even in the in the, uh, in the uh, kitchen, uh, Norwegians are. So here we are looking down from a almost completed Smith Tower, and you can see right there. There's the Rainier Club. Here's uh, the Methodist church dome, and these two buildings are still there. There are some other buildings that are still there, but I want you to focus now and just look at the Rainier Club Center. And if you look up here, you'll see Queen Anne and Lake Union. Well, this was a view that no one had seen before. And a photographer climbed up to the unfinished 35th floor of the Smith Tower and shot through the girders. And uh, he was a Webster and Stevens photographer named Frank Noel. And it was a view that, that no one else uh, no civilians were to see for another year until the Smith Tower opened. But uh, today, watch for Lake Union now. Hmm. Okay, let's go back and watch the Rainier Club and the corner of the Watch the Rainier Club. Point out again. Oh, wow. So there it is, right there. Mm -hmm. And we go forward and. It's still right there. Where's the lake? I is it the, it's gone. I don't think there's a lake there anymore. Is, there? is it the is it the thing that has all the uh, the uh, dormers and the sharp peaked little, <laughs> or is it the Methodist dome is right there? Oh, that's the Methodist. It's right, right on yeah. the Seattle yeah. Clubs, or the and it's to the left. It. It's that's the edge of it. You can't see the dome any longer. It's been covered up by this building, which we will return to. Right. Well, where's, where's the lake? I think it's a series of reflections. <clears throat> All we can see is this, the shattering of, you know, the, the reflective Gene, would you a cookie, Gene? No. <laughs> <laughs> the Monongahela passing through the Aurora Bridge. Oh, my God. Uh, the Monongahela was towed at this point. This is like late 31. It was towed away from... Lake Union, where it had been for several years. Uh, this beautiful four-master uh, was uh, uh, escaped before the, the bridge was completed. And then it was sold off to, um, uh, converted into a barge and sold to the Kelly Logging Company of Vancouver, where it finally was survived a few years hauling logs and before it was scrapped. But here it is escaping before the bridge, the cantilevers are stretched across. Do you know when the ship was built? Yes, yeah, so I think I, I think we have it here, don't we, Paul? Well, Glasgow, I, I 1882. It, uh, but, uh, I've forgotten so much. Well, it was Glasgow in 1882, and we actually featured. There's another ship we feature in the column, which was also a Glaswegian hmm. vessel called. I don't know how you ever remember the name of the ship, but here he goes. What no. was the name of it? <laughs> no, now I forgot. It's a wonderful name. Extahican. No, what is something it? Something close to that. Yeah, yeah somewhere. Well, so, you get credit for that. Well, we go up now. We're going to look at, at just a few months after the Monongahela passed underneath the girders here, the cantilever. And we're going to take a look at 
Why is there uh, the interference lines on that projector? See all those interference lines, those curves? Yeah. yeah. Shadow and light, it's, shadow and light. It's just, it's, it's just the digital age, Paul, sometimes. No, you don't get them all the time. It's, you get it's, them all the, it's the wood grain effect. What is the, it's the wood grain effect. Yeah, that's right. It's special. You have to pay special for it. So this <laughs> is the, will, okay. the William, <laughs> William Howard Taft key. It was given to, to uh, President Taft in 1909 by a, a gold miner who actually did strike a rich. Mm -hmm. And you can see around the outside of this telegraph key, his, he studs it with, with uh, nuggets, nuggets of, of gold that he found in the Yukon. Uh, the key's significant because it was used by uh, William Howard Taft uh, in 19, uh, 1909, but it was again used by um, uh, Herbert Hoover in, on George Washington's 200th birth birthday in uh, March 22nd, February 22nd, 1932. And this was the opening of the George Washington Memorial Bridge, which we just saw from below. And this, this, as the story goes, there were huge crowds waiting on either side, and the, the then governor, Roland Hartley, uh, who had opposed the bridge for... Heartless, Heartless Hartley, they call Heartless Hartley, who had opposed the bridge, was standing uh, at a podium uh, pontificating about, about what a wonderful thing this was, and, and he was a bit of a blowhard. And at 2.57 that afternoon, Herbert Hoover in Washington, D.C. pressed the telegraph button on the Taft key, and fireboats sent their plumes of, of, of water into the air, and, and fireworks went off, and the flags were unfurled. You can see one of them coming down from above, and the crowd streamed onto the bridge from both sides, and hardly never got to finish the speech. Uh, that was an embarrassing slip for another megalomaniac. <laughs> But we've gotten rid of all megalomaniacs. So the Washington Bridge, I didn't know they had that name. Yeah, I didn't know the Bridge. George Washington Memorial Bridge. Isn't, isn't, that, still, isn't that something? I've lived here all these years and didn't realize oh, well, that. We all call it the Aurora Bridge. Right. People, I was going to ask when the George Washington, I knew it was called that, but I didn't know when that fell out of use. Um, well, it still isn't out of use. It's used so much. It's like, who says the Lacey V. Merle Bridge? Yeah. Evergreen Point. Right. Yeah, they see people here. Right. Yeah. Who says the Mercer Island Floating Bridge? Mm -hmm. That's not the name of it. Right. <coughs> and of course, so we have a couple photos here. Now, of, here is Herbert Hoover using the Taft key to do exactly what we just described. And if we jump forward a little bit, and we will see John F. Kennedy in 1962 oh, using the Taft key to open the second Seattle World's Fair. Hmm. How many of you went to the second World's Fair? That was called Century 21. That was not one. Oh, I did. Jane, did you do? 62. Jane, did you go? Me? No, I was in Germany. I was four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I was, I was in high, uh, just before I finished high school. Oh, yeah. Clay, did you go? Of course, yeah. I was 11. Uh, were you part of any group that performed? No, but I got a newspaper, a tabloid newspaper that they were selling at a souvenir stand that you could put any headline you wanted at the uh -huh. top, and mine says, Clay Eels jumps off Space Needle. <laughs> you still have it? I, I still have it. Oh well, we're going to look at another piece of that. That's it's, awesome. It's kind of prideful, but also self-destructive. <laughs> We're going to look at another piece of memorabilia from the fair right before the hall. I think Gene wants to move forward. I do. This is six-year-old. What were you saying? That's I'm trying to talk over the top of Gene. What was this? Is, is that pride before a fall? Yeah. Oh. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Gene. Now you win. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is young Paul Dahl, who uh, was from Seattle, and at six years old in 1962, she arrived at the fair and was heralded as the nine millionth visitor, and uh, she got this enormous dog. Whoa. She had a very embittered sister there behind her. <laughs> <laughs> These are her parents looking on with, with joy. And here she is 
uh, with her class of students in Issaquah. Still has the nine million sign on the wall, and what a great uh, device for a teacher to talk about. Oh that. my gosh, yes. Yeah. So she came out and posed with us oh, with the sign. The repeat is the sign. And you could hear the students mumbling. And I was just talking about that sign again. <laughs> <laughs> this is the fire. This is the fire. It's, it's one of the few pictures of the fire actually burning. Uh, and Paul posited in his original column that it was because the photographers were saving their equipment. Well, it, they are saving their studios. Yeah, well, yeah. They, they didn't have much luck if they were down. It could be equipment, it could be images, it could be... Yeah. Really, you're going you're gonna to quibble about equipment and studios? If I... This fire is... <laughs> quibble? I mean, yeah, that's it. accurate, that's all. Yeah, they're saving their equipment. They're saving their students. They're grabbing their cameras. They're grabbing their plates. Are they trying to trying to tear down the walls and walk away with the? No, it's equipment. I think that completely covers it. You said cameras. Go ahead. Good God. Okay, look up here. Fry Opera House, right up here. That this guy's standing up top. Nobody died, but he should have. Yeah. That guy right there. Yeah, you're tough, you're tough. It's Clay. Clay's a new trumpet. <laughs> yeah. That's Clay, right. Yeah, he's getting ready to run. Clay jumps off Fry Opera House. All the buildings in this photo burned down. 30 blocks burned down. You really get that. Video. So what, what street is this? This is Spring. Oh, you probably said that already. I didn't, but oh. the modern photo shows us exactly where it is. So we are at first in Spring. Oh, OK. And of course, you get a lot of nice curves on uh, this particular projector. Jeez. So, a couple days later, the photographers rescued their cameras and went down and started to shoot. And this is a classic photo of, uh, I'm told, a bank entrance. But it was also the entrance to the Occidental Hotel, which became, or not the hotel, but it was a, you see the top the stories of the Occidental Hotel, and we can look at it today, which is pretty close to the same location. There's the Pioneer Building, right. and what has replaced that hotel today is... Anybody know the name of it? The ugly piece of crap. Ugly piece of crap. Garage. Piece of crap. Yeah. The sinking, oh, sinking, ship. Name. sinking ship garage yeah. right there. Yeah. You do that? I did, from one of your columns. Okay. We're going to go forward and revisit the sinking ship garage in a moment. It was replaced by the Seattle Hotel, and this is a photo taken around 1908. And the, uh, the Seattle Hotel is this, uh, uh, I mean, it's, you, you can see this belongs in Pioneer Square. But it was removed from us in, when was that? When did they tear it 61, down? 62. And what happened after 61, 62, they replaced it with uh, garage, which we just saw. Well, and you can see it right there. There it is again. And again, we have a person here who understands the name of it. What was the name of it again? The Sinking Ship Garage. Very good. Now, they were very sensitive when they made this replacement. Book too, okay. They were so sensitive when, when they made this replacement. They, the architects of the Sinking Ship Garage knew that they had to match the neighborhood and come into some kind of congruence. So, if you look, you can see these lovely basket handles no. reflecting no. No. the merchant's building no. basket no. handles. What a, what a mess. Isn't that a lovely touch? Yeah. Uh, Paul, no. Paul thinks it's, it reveals a sensitivity of character and spirit and a moral vision. <laughs> a moral vision? I th isn't that a moral vision? I think it's a moral vision. Yeah. I think so. Giving us the joy of... Yeah. Did you say moral vision? <laughs> moral vision. <laughs> Um, what is a moral vision? I'm not even sure. Did that spur uh, conservation efforts? You're looking at it. Now you get, okay. That was the best introduction we've had so far through two or three weeks of doing this. Oh. You had the perfect interjection because now he's going to talk about that. Okay. Gee. Well, exactly so. And it actually spurred the preservation of the Pike Place Market, which was under threat in the late 60s. A mayor named Wes Ullman was a Ginnett, uh, and uh, he, uh, uh, they wanted to tear it down and replace it with what? Condos? 
apartment buildings? Um, yeah, 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 that's right. Condos and apartment buildings and parking garages. And parking garages, yeah. yeah. Maybe we could sink a few more ships. I think, I think of the word hotel fits in here, too. Hotel, too. Well, they were going to tear it all down and replace it, and a man named Victor Steinbrook, after whom a park at the end of, at the north end of the market is named, an architect uh, whom I got to know because he was married to a friend of mine, but he... What's the friend of yours? What's the history of your friend? She was an actress, Marjorie yeah. Nelson. Well, yes, and they were married, weren't they? They were married. You didn't mention that. I did. I said she, oh. he was married to a friend of oh, mine. I'm sorry. So, Victor was inspired by the loss of that, uh, of the Seattle Hotel, to, uh, to join with other preservationists and actually save this beautiful touchstone of sort of the center of Seattle. How many of you have heard of Victor Steinberg? Raise your hand, please. One, two, three, four. You never heard of him, huh? Now you have. Most of the people have. So he's really one of the real heroes of Seattle history. And you better learn it. <laughs> My husband not, should be that here. Part wasn't cut <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the original photo was actually this is before this is right at the very start. So there was there were it was another year before they were putting up the the, the, yeah, the stalls, tents and campuses. And, uh, yeah, and I, I didn't realize that the uh, building on the corner that we see in the now photo doesn't go back that far. No, that's that pit. That was uh, with the Paramount uh, Theater advertisement. Uh, it had been a hotel called the Hotel York, mm. and they had to tear it down because why? That's the longest the, railway in the world. That's a good point, Gene. Why don't you finish the thought? Well, the longest railway tunnel in the world was passing under the York Hotel, and it was shaking it so badly when, the, when they were digging the tunnel. Tunnel. Oh, it's another tunnel. It was, but it was shaking the foundation so badly that they realized that the York was doomed. And the railroad tunnel, of course, went from... Why was it the longest in the world? Well, it went all the way from Virginia to Washington. Oh, 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 oh. that's a good joke. <laughs> okay. I did. Okay. That's, I did. That's, I'm sorry, I apologize for that. Oh, folks, he's here till Tuesday. Oh. Try the meal. Okay, now there's going, to be a, there's going to be a real prize for somebody who can identify what this is. I think I know. It's not clay. Now, if you've been following Paul's column, you probably saw this nice. I did. That's why I think I know. And you're out. Is. You're okay, out. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it Skid Road? It looks like Skid Road, doesn't it? It's not Stephen. It's not Stephen. It's not Stephen. It's Stephen. It looks. It could be the Burke Yeah, Gilman. I don't know. Except think, the Burke Gilman would have had. Think about track. something that makes you really angry on a regular basis. Good point. Cutting down trees. Oh, they did certainly cut down some trees. This is a picture taken by a, a, a Boeing engineer named Werner Lingenhager. And in the mid. Did that help at all? It makes me hungry for pancakes. How about having uh, a cookie? How many candy cookies? In the mid 50s. Stop tempting. He, he, he does this to me all the time. Talk. He just talk. Oh, she's, she's celiac. You, you should <laughs> tempt her with cookies. I asked her what you can you eat know, that's sweet. You know what? They Let's make, find they out. make endless, she endless, can eat chocolate. endless options for people like me nowadays. There's no shortage. Okay. So, yeah. Let's look at what this became. Mid 50s. Here it is. Very well. yeah. Oh, do you get, do you get wow. Oh my God. Can, we, can we get a go back room? Yeah, let's take a look. Oh my God. Melrose Place. And it turned into within about, oh, they dug God. the ditch about five years after this photo was taken, and then they they wow. turned it into I-5. Wow. And Werner knew that this was coming, so he took it in both directions. And in the book, you see both directions. You can see looking north and looking south to town. What's that overpass there, that first overpass? Anybody? Where the olive? What olive? Oh, well, that's good. Olive's the next one. Oh. Oren? No. That's not Denny. Denny. Is it Denny? That's Denny. Oh, Denny. oh, I guess it is. You can smell the olive. Yeah. You can smell no, the olive. Yeah, I go down. Oh, because it's a little fly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is your home. Yeah, I got it. So here we are at, uh, at the U.S. Post Office at 3rd and Union. It was a beautiful structure, and, and all these, uh, look at these proto-Victorians with their, their big hats and their, I don't think the man are Edwardians. They're Edwardians? Yeah. Well, here's You're right. Huh? Well, it was finished about 1907. Yeah. Those are, are those, those are the J.D. Ross lamps, are they? 
Mm -hmm. That's not that's not from Diablo or from the, the predates. Diablo, right? that's a film. Yeah, this is pre, this is 1908. Okay. So they opened this beautiful structure. <laughs> what did you do? What was your question? Sorry, no, I know that if they were lamps from Ross, from the from, Ross is from the Seattle Light deep. and Power Diablo Dance. Yeah, I know he had some right. specific. He designed those. You're right, 1911. But that's but those yeah, are the, those bell those 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 uh, standards. Those light standards were designed by J.D. Ross. Yeah. Oh, they were. Okay. So these are in 1908. He designed these. Well, I don't know the exact year, but this this photograph's later than 1908. No, it's 1908. Well, then that would tell us that he did it before yeah. by 1908. <laughs> well, why are you so sure? Sorry, it's I it is because it's in your column and who's uh, <laughs> <laughs> talking now? <laughs> you can you can deny your own. It's just like uh, I don't, I don't mind doing so that. Peter did it three times. So Peter did it three times. I was going to say. You learn when you really go. Get older if you don't get embarrassed. You wrote it. Well, I want to know what happened. Uh, well, let's talk about what yeah, happened in this place. Why is that? Every one of these Edwardians or pre Edwardians would say, Meet me at the steps. And they would all meet on those beautiful chuckanut sandstone steps. And uh, so by 1958, they were covered with pigeon poop. And it was decided that. Uh, it, this, the sandstone had to be replaced with something more durable and, and, and prettier, so they, they chose they chose the, the, this. So that's what, uh, it's still a post office, but it's filled with unhappy people. But where, where did the pillars and everything go? They were torn down. Uh, the pillars, where did they go? Yeah, they were torn down. That's, that's well, there insane. might be some of the remnants. I've got remnants of uh, Meany Hall, which was Similarly, Beaux Arts and the University campus. Mm -hmm. I have some remnants of that and shared remnants of that with collectors when I found them in a garage thing? sale on top of Green Anne Hill. Is that the Hooper? Uh, hmm? This sure is Hooper. Like yeah. That's Hooper. If you do a quick count, you'll see there's about 250 of the 500 shacks that were in this particular area, which had been dockland. And uh, you can see mid 30s, obviously, and up here there's Smith Tower, still at this point, uh, a very tall building. Still was the tallest east of the west of the Mississippi. West of the, west of the Mississippi. Of the Mississippi, I think west it was in 35. Sometimes even west of uh, Ludwig, Ohio. This was taken from the B.F. Goodrich. Ohio had a water tower that was pretty tall. This was taken from the B.F. Goodrich building, which no longer exists. And uh, did you just make that up? Yeah, I did. That's good. I thought that's you might have. Right. Call, there's four corners in there. You can pick any one of them to stand in. Did you have a hat, though? <laughs> no, I don't have a hat. I'm not doing it. So here we are today. We're going to look at a return to the docks. Port of Seattle gave, gave me a lift truck, and I got up in the air, and we still have the Smith Tower. Wow, but that's that's what it's become today. Wow, these changed a lot. Can you and go we're back? Actually, interestingly, we're, we're, we just received uh, our nearly five thousand books arrived in the port uh, of Tacoma this afternoon. We've been waiting for it. We've been in a little trade war with China. Which is so we're hoping that all will sign up for you here tonight and come down to the port tomorrow and help us load the cars. <laughs> So, mm -hmm. you'd love to, wouldn't you? I love to You know, we talked to some motormen yesterday. Yeah. And uh, what did they insist upon calling? We, we kept calling them trolleys, and they were very, very street cars. with us. Um, they just said, these are street cars. Don't call them trolleys. They yeah. were very sensitive about it. It's true. They yeah. slapped us around, hither and yon. Is the truth. Trolleys yeah. are attached. Are they attached to the top? top? Yeah. They're attached on the bottom instead of the top. Oh, is that? Yeah, okay. Well, no, there's cable cars. Yeah, they're running. Not yeah. every streetcar is a cable car. No. Well, this was the difference then that they were promoting? I don't, I don't remember. Is a trolley a single truck? No. Trolleys are on the top. But uh, the, um, this was one of the, one of the last trolleys running through Fremont. <laughs> And it was taken by the, and I'm going to keep saying trolley because I, 
they're still trolleys. I don't care what the motor well, is. Well, that's what Clay says, they're trolleys. They're trolleys. <laughs> that's a trolley, isn't it, Clay? It looks like a trolley to me. They said streetcar. Yeah, bike racks no, and bike. It does look like a bike rack, doesn't it? Maybe a cow pusher. I think we should have. Um, Are we going to vote now? A vote on this, yeah. Okay. It's also, it's also a people catcher. Yeah, I'm sure that's good. Uh, what's your name? You. Kent. Kent, you're very bright, and I want you to vote my way. <laughs> <laughs> always with the politics. All right, all those for a streetcar, please raise your hand. One, two, three, yeah, four. Yeah, yeah. All yeah, those at five. Okay. All those for any other name, please. Raise your hand. <laughs> I, I'd so like trolley. I, I like the word trolley. But I've seen streetcar used more in discussions of local history. But it's because streetcar is correct. Okay. So let's go forward and. and <laughs> This is right before the oil companies came in and, and helped us introduce gasoline-powered buses and uh, with rubber tires, and they got rid of these lovely old street cars. Which we still have. And uh, actually, the city was buying gasoline buses with rubber tires 20 years before this. But there was a big push in the in the 40s from the oil companies to replace and, all of and these. Goodyear. Goodyear. They yeah. were and Goodyear. Goodyear. From what? What, what, what the other one? Record suggests. Huh? Goodyear. Goodyear. And another one? Oh, uh, B.F. Goodrich, maybe? Or something Michelin? Something having to do, no. Well, maybe Michelin. I don't know. There's something having to do with... Uh, Uteroil? With uh, clutches and uh, internal combustion. Oh. I don't remember. Well, in any case, this was a year, and my mom was born in 36, and she remembered taking the, the streetcars all over Seattle. And by the time the war was over, uh, everything, they'd all been taken away uh, and replaced with, with buses. Gasoline. In 40 is actually when it started. Yep. And it was done by 42. Ripping up the, maybe all the rails they had to wait something down right on Fremont. Of and of course, we have to do something in Fremont that reflected the absence of streetcars. <laughs> and we chose uh, several women walking abreast. This is the only nudes to ever appear in, uh, it never appeared in the Times, but it does appear in the book, so we thought we'd. So it looks like some of the buildings are still there, which is what I thought in the first picture. I thought it looks like Fremont. Oh my gosh. But you look there are a couple that are still there. The, the church, actually. Which you can see. Oh, got it now. Okay. Fremont Baptist yeah, is still there, there yeah. though it's uh, obscured. You did a nice shot of them with their orchestra. Remember that scene? I do. How could I forget? And they're actually up behind the trees here, so they're kind of concealed. Yeah. Up. Mm -hmm. And the Times would not print this. No, we just you had already done the column, and so we were forbidden from even attempting a print. Bad timing. Mean. This is the Go Hing celebration in Chinatown, another area of Seattle which has not changed much. All of these buildings are still standing. And here's a, a, a celebration in the early 20s. And I love this lion dancer here. And uh, to go back and repeat this, I found, uh, I went to the Seattle Kung Fu Club where the, the, the founder and director of the club, Sifu Zhang Meung, who was a teacher of Bruce Lee's and came here in 1960, is still running the place. And he brought his entire group out onto the street on King, and we reshot it. Oh, that's excellent. Oh, are they in the Hotel Milwaukee? They are, which is right there. Mm -hmm. They are not. They're, they're, uh, they're about three doors down. Oh, okay. So they're, they're just, this is right outside their, it's King their little shop. I, I stumbled into a performance on Chinese New Year there about three years ago. Oh, it's, mm -hmm. it's wonderful. It's lovely. Yeah. And here is John Leung here, and he just turned 80 this year as well. Very cool. Yeah. not know he was still teaching. Yeah. He, he's, uh, he's kind of a, an, an amazing guy to watch, and you it sort of speaks to the uh, to the efficacy and the power of martial arts to see him, you know, still teaching right. and, and working. Mm. Whereas for old cigarettes, 
smokers like myself who also are 80 who don't smoke cigarettes and have a strange capacity to resist cookies and donuts. <laughs> we don't exude any of that strength or moral fortitude. Fortitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, here we are at a uh, a little river that no longer exists. I was going to say that's the Black River. river. I have yeah, a exactly. picture similar to that that I used. This is it's the Black River. Obviously it's not your picture. But it's, it's it's one that Paul used in uh, a pretty early column. Um, and of course, the Black River disappeared for the most part when they lowered Lake Washington by nine feet. And one of the victims of that lowering was the Black River, which is now, it pops up in some culverts and, and uh, burbles up in a couple of swamps, but for the most part, it's gone. It was the outlet from Lake Washington to the Sound. So fresh to salt. And when they lowered Lake Washington to the level of Lake Union and then created the Ship Canal, that became the new and rather con more controlled passage. And it dried up the ground upon which the Duwamish Indians had been shunted. So for thousands of years, this was a, interestingly, I, for thousands of years the Duwamish lived alongside the Black River. And so by get rid of, getting rid of it, they ended um, thousands of years of, of salmon fishing and it was a, another way to, to diminish the, the tribes. And we will deal with this tomorrow when we're at the Duwamish Longhouse. Um, their long struggle for recognition is based in large part upon what they call proving a continuous existence. And when they get shunted from place to place they were losing tribal members who would join other tribes or die or, mm -hmm. or, or leave. And so even geography took, took its, you know, the... Absolutely. The, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. It's especially tough for the lowland tribes, right? Because they were pretty migratory. Yeah. They didn't necessarily stay in one place all year because they, different things were in season at different times and so they moved around. Well, this is the, the Black River today. <laughs> Stop right here. You know, I cut that. I cut that picture out of because when I when I talk about the one in Lake Washington, I cut cut this out from your column and put it in plastic, and I pass it around because that shows where the Black River. Right. There's supposed to be a plaque down at the end of the air the air. Um, that mentions the Black River. The air air. Somewhere yeah. that says that. Okay. There's a there's a stretch of it in a park in Renton. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and it's like a, it's basically a little creek. Yeah. In a much larger little burbling up. Yeah. And it flows the other direction. When it does flow at all, it flows mm. the other direction. So we now jump to uh, Lake Union, the the level to which Lake Washington was lowered. And with the development along the shores of Lake Union, we see this young couple, brother and sister, the Browns. Uh, they, um, today, were just about Aloha on the other side of Westlake. And these are my neighbor's kids, Tia and Weana, taken in 2011 for the Mohai show. And here they are today. Yeah. All grown up. So that was reclaimed land. Uh, is that why we're on dry land there versus the Yeah, they even? they pushed out. They they built up and and pushed out into Lake Union. So of course this is the Kalakala, and it's passing uh, from uh, Lake Union out into the through the locks, out into the Sound, and it was a big excursion. Why were they doing this, Paul? Well, I read a caption on this that said it was the only time that the clock had come through the locks. I don't know why that would be, but that's what that's what it claimed. Maybe because it was so busy, hmm. or maybe it may have been coincident with needing some work on, on the Lake Union uh, dry dock, and just they and then they brought the kids and come and on down, and down from the hills and go taking the clock back into Puget Sound and 
Take a ride and we'll take a picture. Is um, that an outdoor passenger deck? Is are those people standing? Yeah, there? right. There's an outdoor passenger. Yeah. yeah. And you know what we're doing with that in So uh, this is another photo I had to repeat some way. I couldn't just get an empty lox. So I went back and found one big boat coming through, which had just finished about a month and a half of repairs. And here it is. This wow. is the USS Turner Joy. Does anybody know the Turner Joy? Clay, do you know the Turner Joy? Not as well as you. Well, students of history, students of history might know this boat because it was involved with the USS Maddox yeah, in 1964. Oh, this is Gulf of Tonkin. Yeah, this is Gulf of Tonkin. Tonkin. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the Gulf of Tonkin was, of course, the event which, uh, in which uh, the Maddox and the Turner Joy and a few North Vietnamese gunboats got into a skirmish on August 2nd, I think. And then, uh, and then nothing else happened. But, uh, but a, another skirmish was alleged a couple days later, which which never actually did occur, and uh, but based on the on the uh, on the second skirmish, Lyndon Johnson uh, plunged us headlong into the Vietnam War. It became known as the Gulf of Tonkin incident, yeah. Yeah. a euphemism. <laughs> yeah. Eugene, you know what we're doing in Kirkland with the Palapala, right? No. It'll be a, a piece of it'll be on the Cross Kirkland corridor. Oh, cool. And, well, uh, we're concerned about it in my department because things always get graffiti. And well, let's look forward. You can tell us which piece <laughs> because Clay went out uh, in the last day or two, and and here is the in the Gulf of Tonkin mm -hmm. or off the coast of Vietnam. Here's the uh, Turner Joy, but Clay took a picture of the bridge of the Kalakala of the of the wheelhouse. The wheelhouse. I believe that's what part of what we're doing. Let me and this is at outside Salty's restaurant, and there's a he went inside and took another shot looking through it. Oh, that's cool. At the skyline. Oh, that is a cool picture. Yeah, this work. It's amazing that you can still do. So you're going to get a piece of it, and I believe that possibly that. Borrow it from Salty's. No, the, the city actually purchased parts of it, and oh, really? they accepted several proposals about how to display them on the cross Brooklyn border, and one of them just made me laugh hysterically because it was like a giant metal chicken that you could go inside of. <laughs> it was really fun. Uh, well, that would be fun. I, don't, I can't recall which one was. Yeah, well, here's one of the shots we might have to repeat with uh, a drone. Because it's uh, this is taken in April of 1953. New Year's Day, we could, <laughs> except that the it, we have to do it after the night hours now. Oh, to your eyes! If we're going to keep it modern, within yeah. it, within the next year, this is going to be all gone. So this is before the viaduct opened. Why the why the red roses? We don't know. This was a photographer who's. Uh, uh, we've Paul has featured in the column over the years, yeah. and he was an amateur photographer who loved to wander around Great the box. West and take these magnificent pictures. Uh, this is a guy named Horace Sykes, who would uh, who captured some stunning, and lovely images, and it, all over the state, some wonderful shots. Horace wrote a lot of learned essays on photography, which were published in national publications. And then he also belonged to several clubs. It's brand, this is this is before any car traveled on the road. So to say he's an amateur it. means that he doesn't have a studio shot <laughs> on Front Street. That's how ugly it was. They put it up and it already looked beat up, worn, yes. beat up. So here we are, a little more than a year ago, and uh, uh, in about the same spot. But I want to draw your attention to. So you see the Smith Tower and the. And the, the red car in place of it. I want to draw your attention to this building, yep. which was called the Mark, and is now called it's now the F five building. And both Paul and I really it's one of the handful of buildings that we really found ourselves enjoying as we you know, I like it from the street level and as we drive past it it's a, we can see the reflection of the Methodist dome in the in the side of it. It's it truly is 
an interesting structure, and we found out that it was based on, and if you look at the lines there, it's actually based on a photograph from Breakfast at Tiffany's. This photograph was in their lobby when they were building it. The architect created the lines of the building, and I think at least one of them follows that cigarette holder. This is Audrey Hepburn. That's hilarious. Get out of here. Yep. And uh, yeah, the architect was so was such a fan that oh, he made a building with her angular lines, mm. and they originally called it the Mark, and now it's the F5 building. Mm. And as I as I said a couple days ago, my mother actually looked a lot like Audrey oh, Mark. And to prove it, Paul scoffed at me. So I put a picture in. Wow, are you sure it isn't? That's your dad, I know, but that looks like... Audrey Hepburn! Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> she had some of the same angles. Yeah. Now, what is she doing to his head? She was cutting his hair. She, she, she cut her hair all <laughs> of our lives. He had very curly hair, and, and so she was cutting it. Here we are at Green Lake. These, well, these are yeah. the DVD extras. <laughs> An Asher Curtis photo looking down over Green Lake from in 1903, where we and you can see there is there are of course the Olympics hovering behind. And here we are today, about the same spot. You can still see the Olympics back here, and I pretty much have this ridge in the same place, so we're, we're pretty close to this particular spot that Curtis stood on. Gene, this is a good time for you to talk briefly about your pole. Oh! Well, Paul often talks about this, but I have a 21-foot long pole to get me up to, to uh, uh, places where uh, either uh, the, the, the buildings no longer exist or uh, there's no getting up to a second story. Uh, in one case, I took a picture that was repeating an old Seattle photo panorama which is near the start of the book. Uh, and it was it should have been taken from the rooftop of the Bread of Life mission. But they they were they thought that my pursuits were not um, spiritual enough and they didn't want, want to let me up there. Is that what they said? They really said, yeah, they spiritual? Well they they were skeptical of the of the, the joys of history. They because it, I wasn't I wasn't uh, encouraging their mission or their religion. Did you offer them a donation? No. Well, so that may have been part of that. Whoops. It's true, you know. Oh, that was a fairy tale. There it goes. There it goes. So this is an interesting picture, and it was it was given to Paul by a rather famous Seattleite. Paul. Who gave you the photo? Oh, this uh, was a photo that uh, Ivor Hagman had because his mother is in the white dress there, uh, right there, April, and then her mother, Anna, next to her in the dark, and then her father, Hans, uh, right there, you know, and wow. then relatives by marriage. Uh, the other three people are all relatives. Because his father died young, correct? His father his didn't. Father? No, not that young. His mother died. Somebody died. Yeah, right? cancer, uh, and also well, that's it was a sped up death because uh, the quack. He had uh, mm -hmm. she had the quack uh, starvation diet uh, doctor, oh, whose name was Hazard. <laughs> oh, you're talking starvation, right? Yeah, yeah. She, yeah. Was, she was one of the victims of starvation. Yeah, diet, yeah. she was. Oh, boy. What makes this photo particularly interesting is it is the oldest structure in Seattle, still standing. Well, I say is. I hope that would imply it was still standing today. Where is it at? Well, we're going to find out in just a second. So well, as we wait, look at this, what would the oldest structure in Seattle be that wasn't still standing? Well, you could have, you could be talking about older structures that have been demolished. I thought I no. Thought, you mean like I thought the first might have been structure. meaning at the time the photo was taken, it was the oldest structure. You mean oh, yeah. Yeah. It was the oldest yeah. structure? That'll get you out of it. That'll get you. Out. It was also built. By Doc Maynard, huh. and he. Well, uh, well, we don't know he had a hammer, but he paid for it. <laughs> and he moved to. Uh, he sold his or traded his 260 acres downtown 
for about 320 acres in West Seattle and uh, moved lock, stock, and barrel over there. Um, he wasn't, didn't have the best relations with the other settlers. He'd been an Indian agent, and he was close friends with Chief Seattle and, and, uh, and the Duwamish and the Suquamish, and, uh, and actually supported, it was his idea to name Seattle after the chief. Um, but the, other, the others, Denny and Boren and, and some of the others, were not quite as friendly to, to the native peoples. In fact, in 1865, they, they passed, what was it, Proposition 5, which banned natives from actually coming into Seattle and staying in Seattle after night, overnight, unless they, had, uh, they were living with their employer. So they, this, this town that was essentially uh, provided to these folks with the help of uh, Seattle and, and his uh, was the within 15 years they had banned all Native Americans from city limits overnight, and that was overturned in about four years. But there was there was some uh, considerable disagreement between Maynard and, and the others, and to us to uh, to get away from him, uh, they were also on in opposite political parties. To get away from him, he moved to West Seattle started a farm, and nearly starved to death. It was a very hungry time for Maynard and his wife, Catherine. And this is right on the beach. This, this was right on the beach, yes. It's been moved a block up, and here we see it today, without its western wings. It looks so much smaller now. Yeah. It lost that little... The northern part was chopped off. The northern part. That got chopped. Oh. But I mean, just so even so, the proportions, it just... I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying it looks. It does, it's, it seems, there's that same roof line. Right, I've never had that sense that it looks smaller than me. And I find it fascinating that you feel that, because I don't feel it. Maybe it's because the people are standing closer to the I people. think that's what it is. And they changed the windows too, so that changed. Oh, they did that's change the windows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised it lived that long, not just because, of, but the, the condition in the earlier photo, it looked like it was five years past needing a coat of paint, but there it is today. Yeah, yeah. And that's probably taken in the, oh, sometime in the 90s. Hmm. It'll be in the book I'm writing called The Illustrated Iber. Hmm. You remember that? Buy several copies. After you bought several copies of Seattle, now and then. Is it then and now or now and then, guys? I hope it's then and now. So, Paul, where is this? Same as the column, Paul. Seattle, well, it's then and, no, the column is now and then. Same as the column, Paul. Seattle, now and then. Yeah. All right. I saw you're promoting it because you're wearing your eyes. So, Jean, where is this? Well, well, so, this is at the end of the street. There's no marking on that house. And Clay, actually, after we harassed him, because he had been head of the Southwest Seattle yeah, Historical really Society, Clay. we harassed him for a while. So he went down at the end of the street, and at the, at the end of this street, close to the waterfront, there is this plaque inserted into the sidewalk. What was it put there? I don't know. I'm guessing about, about 20 years ago. Does it mention the Hanson House? I mean, the... the, the uh, you can uh, see down, house. yes, you can see the last few lines of this specifically address it. Right here. Gene, can you read them? I say this. Uh, oh, early pioneer entrepreneur and Indian agent Dr. David Doc Maynard opened a trading post on the Duwamish River. He became such a good friend, such good friends with Chief Seattle that Maynard named the new city Seattle after Seattle. In 1857, Doc Maynard traded 260 acres in Seattle with Charles Terry, proprietor of the New York Cash Store, for 320 acres here at Alki. Maynard then developed a potato farm using Alki Beach kelp for fertilizer, certainly a man ahead of his time. He also built a sturdy farmhouse, which is now the oldest standing piece of architecture in all of Seattle, and is here at 64th Avenue Southwest, but it's actually down the block from this plaque, so... Well, it's not a, it's here at 64th Avenue, okay. It's hiding. Uh, so, but they didn't give the address. They didn't, and they also didn't put a picture in, so there's no way for you to find it. Unless you can walk yeah, down the street on. with the book. Well, <laughs> Clay was the uh, chairman of the director of the uh, West Seattle Historical Society for about 20 years. How many years were you there, Clay? I've been involved with them since it began. Uh, how, how long were you the director? 
five years. Five years. There wasn't a director before then. Oh, uh, you created the But I've been. Power <laughs> grab. Anyway, so he, he's the expert on West Seattle. And he. Yeah, there you go. Any questions on West Seattle? <laughs> so. What are we doing on West Seattle show, Dean? <laughs> we are tomorrow. Already there. <laughs> We're doing it tomorrow. Too. We're at the Duwamish tomorrow, though. Yeah. So. That's right. Okay. We'll, we'll this is uh, this is a photo taken of uh, Angeline, mm -hmm. daughter of Chief Seattle, mm -hmm. who was called Angeline by Catherine Maynard, uh, Doc Maynard's second wife, and uh, the uh, uh, and she had a, a, a shack below the market, below Western. And uh, up until last November, uh, the precise location was was not known. But so what's the meaning of precise? I don't know. What does precise mean? Well, you used it. Well, it. let's say within within uh, 100 yards. Oh, that's not precise. No. But anyway, go ahead your story. You're just such a picky no, guy. Like, I've had such complexities regarding that. That whole process of finding a place. He's having a donut. I get really a big big big. <laughs> Well, we can actually. I, I, go ahead. I, I'm at a loss for words. I'm just. I won't say. It. You, you finish it up, Paul. You tell the story about how Ron Edge found it, uh, and then we can go forward. So tell me. Tell us the story about the details of triangulation and finding okay. the precise location and why precision only means ten feet or. Charles Grayson, who was a real student of local history and also of Native American history and I, 20 years ago, agreed that we would figure out where that cabin was. We knew the picture and we started collecting information on it and images of the neighborhood that would help us research it and determine it. So we have a large file on it. He died and so I said to myself, this would be a nice thing to do for him. Let's continue and figure this out. And that motivation was in large part the reason why we got to work doing the fine tuning. Now, here enters Clay Eels, a friend and a man of considerable skills in drawing lines and seeing relationships and drawing You're thinking of a man named Ron Edge. What did I call him? Clay Eels. Oh, Ron Edge. Yeah, Art, sorry, Ron, Ron Edge. Edge is I, get to, I don't get that confused ordinarily. No, Ron Edge. Don't. So he took what information we had, which we won't enumerate now, but he took what information we had and did really a wonderful job of figuring out within a few feet with triangulations from trees and other buildings uh, where the thing sat. And that's the, that's the story. It's pretty close so to your own story. Where does it sit? It's pretty close He's to my own story. Show you. He's going to show you. I'm going to show you. Now, Are what I thought you? was marvelous about it is that, in fact, this is the only slot coming down from Western Avenue below Pike Place Market, which is open to the to the air. Still, it's the one spot. Everything else is filled with buildings, and you know, it's so this particular picture looks to the north east. From where the below us, very close to where, with you know the um, the stairway there that goes down mm -hmm. to the market, mm -hmm. and that's about 20 feet behind the photographer. Go ahead. Huh. Well, it's not there yet. I mean, if you were suddenly and magically to appear, it would be about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Ron Edge and I went down. Ron had spent a lot of time looking at these old photos, triangulating. Here he is sitting in the same spot on her porch. And this was north, northeast. Between. Or northeast, or east, northeast. Just east, east, northeast. Yeah. Between the parking garage for the Pike Place Market and the Fixed Medor building on the right. And the stairways on the other side of the Fixed Medor, the one you've taken to go from the market down to the waterfront. The one that goes up by what? A pike. pike. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just okay. Pike, right? Has there been any effort to put a monument or something there? We just did this last November, and no one has touched us with a 10-foot pole, and neither have they touched. So the oldest house is unmarked, and Princess Angeline's original shack is unmarked. I would think that the Seattle, that the um, 
Pike Place Market Historical Society will get to it at some point because they know all about it. So that's on and pay attention Pike? to it. It'll happen. If it doesn't, then Gene will really give them help. He'll get at it. Gene will get on their back. Ron, Ron and Clay will give them help. Picketing out in front. Ron and Clay with Gene, they'll get all together and knock them. How about some cookies, guys? Anybody with some cookies? <laughs> so here we are with Princess Angeline again in the early 1890s. She would pose for photographs and collect a little spare change. She did laundry. Uh, she was a, a recognizable figure on the streets and pretty well known uh, as you know the daughter of Chief Seattle, who's there on the inset on the right. So what we did, this is right down below uh, what is now First Avenue and along Post Alley, before the market by a good 16 years. So first is up a up above. First is up above. Yeah, right to left. We're going to look at the modern photo so we can solve these mysteries very quickly, but I want to say before we go to it that we found a couple of direct descendants of both Princess Angeline or Kiki Soglu, as she was known, and Chief Seattle. Where did you find them? We, they were just paddling around in canoes. And here they were. This is Mary Lou Slaughter. <laughs> And this is Ken Workman. Mary Lou is the great, 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 great granddaughter of Princess Angeline. And Ken is the great, 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 great grandson of Chief Seattle via his second wife. And Mary Lou is a magnificent basket maker and made these cedar shawls that they're wearing. And, uh, and I'm not going to ask anyone to vote on this, but I think they are absolutely, they, he looks like the the, both of them look like the, uh, you know, it's more Hollywood than, uh, they're the most beautiful people we've, we, we have in the book, I'd say. They're just right up near the top there. And Mary Lou is 80 years old, another 80-year-old. And well, will she be there tomorrow? I don't think she will. Ken might be there. Mm -hmm. I was thinking when they came here to Bellevue and did something, and the Wamish came and did a big day with us. Um, that she she was there. Mm -hmm. She lives in she Kit, South Kitsap, so it's it's a big. It's a commute, but she does make a trip well, over. Well, that was that was probably 10, 10, 12 years ago. So. Mm -hmm. um, and so Ken tells an interesting story, which uh, he actually went to the Rainier Club, and they did a big, a big uh, in the last month or two, and they had a big. Uh, Ken was telling me. They had a, 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 I think they were talking about the art museum photographs of, uh, of uh, Edward Curtis. Oh, the, the Curtis exhibit. The Curtis exhibit. So Ken was a guest and he talked about his own experiences. Uh, but as we were taking this photo, uh, Ken whipped around a couple times and Clay was behind me taking my picture, taking the picture of Ken and, and Mary Lou. It's set up. It's all set up. And, um, and I said, well, what, what's going on, Ken? What's wrong? He says, well, I don't know. I think someone's trying to pick my pocket. And I said, why? what makes you think that? He says, they, they're tapping me on the elbow. And both of us can attest that for the 10 minutes we were taking this shot, nobody was behind Ken. Paul would say, it's the ghost. It's the ghost. And I would say this is a nudge of history. And I'm a, I, as a skeptic and, a, and an agnostic, I'm happy to let Ken have have the final word here. You're and so generous and, and, and true. And so are you, Paul. Thank you. You're a spirit of generosity. Thank you. And we want to thank you for 37 years of uh, thank of you for this that. column. Uh, thank you for that. And, and we're going to go to you I'm now. Right now, as you can probably tell. And now, let me say this, this is Paul sitting on the standing at the top of Gasworks, taken by the French photographer Beranger. Looking rather piggish. Oh, you're looking. Like a king in his domain. And that's it. Now, okay, I have a question to ask. What PR did you do for this event besides the, the membership list? We emailed that out to our membership list. It goes up onto our, ser our server. 
our website, out to our Facebook groups, and then out to our park partners to distribute as well. Obviously, it was not of much interest to anybody except for these lovely people who showed up. Well, Friday night may be the a challenge. It's a tough time. Yeah, Friday's hard for some people. And, try, and trying to get up and down 405, we have found. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a hassle. Yeah. A devastating <laughs> The The uh, Interstate 405, Seattle's mm -hmm. cheapest parking. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Yeah, that well, is. Thank you for coming, guys. Uh, yeah, you know, thank you for You're a smart group, I can tell you that. It's too much. And, the, and the restraint you've shown in the, in the midst of all these cookies <laughs> is very it's little. Also a group. Yeah, we are. You're going to go on that letter now? We do take credit cards. No, let them Yeah, we do the whole. Excellent. I'm not a, I'd rather, I'm more savory. You want to write. You don't need to say it's not for me or my kid, just whatever you would normally write. And we we're okay. there. We've been doing presentations. We're he loves be here. Yes. Oh yes. I <laughs> spoke with our second time. Um, My husband used to be the bookkeeper at the Log House Museum. Oh, that's nice. So it has it has okay. an emotional feel to us as well. Did he ever embezzle any money? Totally. That's why we're living large in Sabine right now. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> okay. There you go. Okay. Thank you. I don't know. The I'm gonna. Uh, I'll leave it open in case it, so it doesn't oh, smear. Okay. Oh, let me show you. Thank you. Uh, it doesn't have to be to anybody. To, the signature is quite secret. You know how much money you get for this signature? You know, it's worth it, Ron. No. Which is the worth of book? Gene? Oh, it's right in there. Okay. Oh, okay. It's a little small. Right there. Okay. Perfect. How much does our signatures increase the worth? Oh, at least a dime. This is for Eva. She sends her regrets. <laughs> Eva has been. Should we tell? Should her. we mention that to her? She said just names would be great. Okay. Um, uh, she sent her regrets. She uh, was core to our research group. She wrote the uh, newish book on uh, hiking in Newcastle. I don't know if, and oh, so she yeah. got interested in the history by doing that. Yeah. Well, I have gone hiking in Newcastle. I, I got a, I got thrush when I drank out of uh, oh. <laughs> Hole Creek. Is this I, I was no, just just, just name I, is fine. Suddenly my oh, just name mouth is filled up with with oh, open wounds and. My dad yeah. was a doctor. Well, I, I was we, I was so thirsty. We were fired. Right. J O E. J O E. Everyone who wrote on the Kalakala, and I, mm -hmm. I'm not in that number. Fletcher. Fletcher would say that it was it, it was the it was the, e -C -E. the marine equivalent of a single stroke engine. They grew up, grew up in because Seattle. It, it, everyone riding was on up. My dad was a foreman such over a at uh, for J D Ross up at the Gorge Dam. Um, you, um, you always knew the clock was passing by because of the. The roar, How do you spell Fletcher? F L E C H. So it was, it was not a pleasant. So, so this is a that one best best remembered rather than experience. Well, experience. well in, in in harbor that you could experience it, but to yeah. actually yeah. travel on it was pretty noisy and good point. And, and huh. uh, a boat at rest. A boat at rest. It was it was lovely. And Paul actually in his original poem points out that this was made in 1935, mm -hmm. and it was a great distraction from the from the depression of the depression. Oh, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Deep We're hiking for a couple days right along the Boulder Creek. The date is was the 16th of November. It was not the place to uh, to drink out of the stream. Well, I no. only got stung by nettles when we went. So. Yeah, it's a dangerous <laughs> place out there. It is dangerous. To answer yeah. your question it's about the Kalakala, the city purchased a wheelhouse, doors, valve wheels, a section of ornament hand railings, the top window section above the car entrance. So there must have so, been, because I, I don't know, do you think they're moving the wheelhouse from West Seattle, Clay? So there must have been another another version or another section of the wheel. Yeah, a lower bridge or something, or yeah. rear bridge. Probably. Or so what knows. they came up with is some guy named Rick Allen proposed this like giant stand up <laughs> spaceship. <laughs> it gets better. Okay, I don't know which one we're actually going with yet, but. Um, is that it? That's the picture of it. Thank you. What is Thank that? you. Splint. But he sounds like you because and you're this the one guy we're just that gonna, this will be in our triangulates and pinpoints things that he it's like it's so tell he Paul that. It's this is going into the collection, Paul. This will be so, in session. Oh, okay. Yep. So no brother by another mother. Anyway, uh, he's uh, <laughs> been. In, we've gone through because his knowledge of the Mohai photos across oh, the different various sub collections is really.